This is the last panel for today. Um, so we've got Barclay Edwards and Ben Fulston from Clinton's, who are going to be going into a bit more detail about the anatomy of a record deal in 2022. So over to you guys. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barclay. I head up uh, the music team at Clinton's. Uh, we are based in Covent Garden, and I'm just straight a talent lawyer. Pretty much all I do all day is look after musicians, producers, and songwriters. Hi, I'm Ben. Oh, that's, that's very loud. It's weird hearing, hearing yourself back. Um, I work for Barclay at Clinton's. So I'm in the music team as well. And actually just hoping to follow in, in his footsteps a bit. And um, yeah, just look after, look after some great artists and help them um, further their careers in the best way possible. So should we kick off through this? So I guess the first thing to do is to explain what it is that a music lawyer can do, what it is that a music lawyer does do in the whole process. Because for a lot of people, the first person they appoint is a lawyer, often before managers. Um, so there are lots of different types of music lawyer, but the type that Ben and I are, are kind of constantly on the lookout for new artists at a very early stage of their career. Often, as I said before, managers, sometimes just after management has been appointed, we get appointed. Um, and a big part of our role in the initial stages of an artist's career, if it's not finding a manager, if the manager is already in place, is um, to help decide whether the right thing to do is to do a record deal, a distribution deal, or to find some other way of releasing music. Uh, it's a massive and fundamental part of the strategy of how an artist moves through their career, and it's changed enormously in the last 10 years. When I started doing it um, 14 years ago, it was basically get a record deal with a major label or an indie, or you were self-releasing, and self-releasing basically was a badge of not really having been able to make it as a professional musician. Now that's totally changed, um, and it's culminated with an artist I represent called Girl in Red, who's just sold a million copies of her first record without a record company. So the landscape has totally shifted, and we're here to just kind of explain a little bit about what it was and what it is, and the various different things you can do as an artist. Ben. So I guess the bigger question is, what is a record deal? And in very basic terms, we'd say a record deal is an exclusive grant of rights in certain recordings or recordings recorded during an agreed period of time with a label, a distributor, or someone else which we'll come to. Um, but I think what the, a more important question is, what do you get in return for licensing or assigning those rights? And just to touch on the point of what a license is and what an assignment might be, a license is when you're giving your recordings to a record company or distributor for a certain period of time, but when you get them back. An assignment usually infers that actually you are giving away your masters forever, or for all intents and purposes forever, so life of copyright, which is death of the author plus 70 years, so quite a long time. So in return for that, you would hope that you get serious sort of industry expertise and industry connections from your label or your distributor, and hopefully a budget in return to help get those records heard, to help market them, to help get them to the listeners' ears. Cool, and we're gonna just use a couple of examples of artists that we specifically work on and have worked on since the very beginning of their careers to illustrate some of the things that we're talking about today. So I just wanna talk very briefly about how things have changed over the last 15 years. So as I said, 15 years ago, if you met your lawyer, you would generally meet your lawyer. In the, in the UK, this is, because in the US, it's always been slightly different. But in the UK, you meet your lawyer because you had a record deal to sign, really. Uh, in some cases, you met a lawyer earlier, and they helped you find a record deal. But ultimately, that was the relationship on the record side of your business. Now, over time, people started realizing that record companies were... Mm, let me, let me put it slightly different way, that the public was finding stuff before record companies were telling them about it. Whereas previously it had been very, very top down, people found out about music from Top of the Pops, from radio playlists. Suddenly, things like SoundCloud started to pop up. And artists that I was working with at the time, like Muramasa, started to really connect as part of an online community that wasn't as a result of a record label telling people what to listen to. The next step on from that was what we did with an artist called Oh Wonder. 
and they are still the first artist in history to sell a million copies of their debut record without a record company. Um, they released a track a year, uh, sorry, a track a week for a year and then bundled them together as an album and released it with a distributor rather than a record company. And it went on to sell a million copies. It's now sold many more than that. Um, and it, that really set an enormous chain of events happening. A lot more people realized that distributors and label services companies were not just where you went if you couldn't get a record deal. They were a way to take the first few steps on, of, of your career um, that a record company wouldn't necessarily help you with. What was interesting that then started to happen was the label services companies began to hire more and more people to fu start fulfilling more and more of the actual label services until we get to now where they've got a lot of the same services as a record company would offer in-house in their companies. So companies like AWOL, Orchard, we'll come to kind of who they are in a little bit. But that started off as a way for people to take the first couple of steps to then still get a record deal and where they are now is a lot of artists are taking those first few steps and then staying on label services for large sections of their career or leaving record companies to go to label services. So for example, I work with an artist called Jungle who used to be signed to XL for their first two records. They're now on AWOL and they've had their most commercially successful, I think it's their most commercially successful record on AWOL last year. Uh, so that's label services rather than a label, which is a very interesting kind of shift in how things have worked. So, Barkley sort of touched on some of those, the key differences and the key different types of record deals, but just to, just to summarise what they are, I think there are, or we think there are three fundamental categories. So the first one is that you have your 80-20 major label deal. So what that means is that the label share of income overall is 80% against the artist, 20%. Now, obviously, that shifts in different ways. So you could, there could be a lower artist royalty or hopefully a higher artist royalty, particularly later on in their career. There's also the 50-50 net receipts or what people would call the independent label model. More recently, we now have the distribution model, which is the 75-25 model, where the artist is actually receiving hopefully 75% or upwards of the total income from their records. Now, there are some key players, obviously, in each, each of those categories. The first one I mentioned is the traditional major label model. So you have your universal Warners and Sony, and within those, there are various labels under each umbrella. So within the universal umbrella in the UK, just as an example, would be Polydor, Island, and EMI. Under the Warner umbrella is Atlantic, Warner Records, and Parlophone. And Sony, Columbia, and RCA, I think, are probably the biggest, the biggest ones to mention. There are also a lot more, I don't want to upset anyone in the room, if there is anyone else here as well, Sony in particular have loads of sort of JV labels or smaller labels like Relentless, Since 93, um, Black Butter, going across the board. So, and then there's the label services, the 7525, and some of the key names in the UK industry are Believe, The Orchard, and AWOL. So how do each of those types of deal work? So I think there's a bit of what I want to talk about is something called recoupment. And I think there's a bit of misconception within each deal as to how recoupment or how the money that the label has spent on the artist is recovered. So under the major label model, of 100% of income that comes in, anything that's been paid out to the artist by way of recording costs or advances is recouped from the 20% that comes in. So the label retains the 80% share. But within that, we would always push for the label to cover any marketing costs to market those records. So that's one of the justifications for doing a deal where that split and is a little bit lower. In the short term, yeah. really expensive for record labels. In the long term, really expensive yeah. for the artists because when they've recouped that marketing cost, they then probably, in a lot of cases, got life of copyright yeah. on 80%. Yeah. And then moving to the independent model, that works slightly differently in that the position you want to get to is that if, for example, a record costs £100 to make and, and £100 to make and market and £150 of income is earned, of £150 that comes in, £100 goes towards recovering those costs of making and promoting the record and the remaining £50, 50 pounds is split equally. There are some steps away with that. So, for example, recording costs are sometimes treated as what's called an advance against the artist. So they're recoupable just from the artist's 
Now, when we're doing a deal, we try and push as far away as we can from that and often achieve it. Sometimes we're not successful, but it's the position we'd like to get to. The difference with distribution and label services is that all the costs that are put forward by that distributor, so if they give you a marketing budget, for example, or they give you a small float to make the records, they are all recoverable from the 75%, which would have otherwise been due to the artist, but with the distributor always retaining their 25% from the first time the records come out. That's yeah, I'd, from the three different ones, yeah. obviously worse for the record label in the short term, better in the long term, yeah. worse for the artist under label services in the short term, but much better in the long term. So I guess the big question is why would... What are the factors that would make you decide to go for a record company deal, a kind of profit split deal, or a label services deal? What, what is it that would make you choose any of those different things? So it's a big part of the early discussions we have with artists. And I'm just going to take you through a few examples of people that we work with. So start with the major label deal. So two artists that we've had a good degree of success with recently from a very early stage, as in before they were gigging really as, as solo artists are Lewis Capaldi and Griff. Both of those artists knew that they wanted to work with major labels very, very early in their careers. So I started working with Sarah when she was 15, 14. Um, and she had a very clear idea about creatively where she wanted to be. Um, and it was a fairly finished product she had in mind. When she started releasing it, the videos had to be amazing, the artwork had to be amazing, the music had to sound incredible. It, couldn't have a kind of DIY aesthetic. So the decision was made by her, do you know what, I'd like to engage with the creative team of a frontline record label, which underlines, actually, I think, one of the big differences still between label services and record labels. The in-house creative teams at record label, at frontline record labels can be absolutely amazing. And the budgets they've got are very, very different to what's available elsewhere. So for her and then also for Lewis, who when he started breaking, they broke him very, very fast. Um, internationally through the Universal Network, which is obviously enormous. Um, and it worked very well for two very mainstream artists. And I'm not saying it only works for mainstream artists. It works very well for... Um, I look after Mark, Michael Kiwanuka, who is not super, super mainstream, but it's also worked very well for him in a kind of curation of a beautiful world around an artist with major label budgets. That's worked very well as well. But some examples of why you might, at an early stage, shoot for a major label deal. Then... Looking at, um, I represent an article called Bicep um, and have done since a very early, early point in their career. Um, they're with uh, Ninja Tune. Ninja Tune, indie label, and Ninja Tune's deal model is generally a 50 50, uh, which they're very proud of and they talk about it a lot in public. Um, so effectively, it's a joint venture between the artist and, uh, and the label, generally seen as a really fair way of a label and an artist working together. Um, the decision there was a lot to do with the fact that culturally Ninja Tune were exactly the right place for that artist to fit. And that, in the indie sector, is still very true. A lot of, if you look at labels like Dirty Hit, Communion, Chess Club, Ninja Tune, XL, 4AD, they're all, if you know the type of music they release, they all release music of a type. There's a kind of fairly obvious culture around these sort of labels, and that often drives a lot of people to make the decision to work in the indie sector. And then... Examples of um, label services that have been really successful. So I've mentioned Girl in Red. Um, the decision with Girl in Red, she had an amazing connection with um, her online community, a global connection with an online community that was going incredibly well. Um, she didn't want external help with the creative of what she was doing. It was all very DIY. She filmed a lot of her videos with her friends around, um, around Oslo. She created her own music with her friends didn't need the creative input of a major label necessarily at that stage. And so doubled down on, on um, label services and initially started with an EP, then a couple of EPs, and then went, in, went into an album. Um, and it's worked amazingly for her. Similarly with um, Georgia Smith, who still hasn't done a record deal. She still works independently. The creative for her is very much done in-house as part of her team. Uh, they haven't felt the need to kind of broaden that out to a more of a major label creative conversation. And so she's, she stayed where she is on, um, on label services as well. So different things inform the decision to go the different paths. The great thing is you can actually have that discussion and that choice now. Ten years ago, it was like major label, indie label, or, or bust. 
now there's a much broader spectrum of decisions that can be made by artists to really, really tailor your career and the, the deals that you do around your career to take you to where you want to get to. So I think that brings us to, to sort of wrapping up, obviously, this section of, um, of the talk, and then I think we can, we can open everything up to some questions. We just wanted to sort of flag a few key things to look out for. The first of those, and something I've found to be a problem recently when taking on artists and trying to help them through their careers, is artists who have signed deals very early on in which they've granted rights and they haven't taken any ad advice. And the most extreme example of that I've seen is when a track is doing extremely well and a record label comes along and says, actually, we want to sign this track. And somebody pops up and says, actually, we own this track. And at that point, that stops the artist doing that next deal, which could help them further their career. So we'd always say, with whatever document comes your way, where there are rights involved, please come and talk to us, because, or talk to a lawyer of your choosing who's very passionate about what you do, because it will really help you get to where you want to be in the long run, once you've had that correct advice. And the general rule is, if you, you can't get into too much trouble if you don't sign anything. That's yeah. a good, good rule to have in the back yeah, of your mind. Definitely. <laughs> Obviously, something else to flag is just when you are looking at deals is just long rights periods as well. So obviously we are now in an age where it's become more normal to get your masters back or to not give your masters away completely in the first place. So looking at deals which, in which your rights are only given away for five years, 10 years, 15 years, that's what we're hoping for. At an early stage as well, just to mention, it's often, I think, very tempting for artists where it's very expensive to I think get your records heard and PR companies are expensive. Getting your records plugged to radio is expensive with very little promise of return. And often, not to mention any names, distributors and other industry bodies will say, give you an amount of money, give you a marketing budget, which is realistically quite small in the grand scheme of things, maybe two and a half, five thousand, ten thousand pounds. But in return for that, they might want some exclusivity in return as an artist. And again, I've seen that inhibit artist careers where, same example, they release a track, they put some budget towards it, it starts to do very well. And then at the moment in time where they've generated some heat within the industry, they've generated an audience, at the time when somebody wants to come along and partner with them, they can't sign a new deal. Or if they do sign a new deal, they can't put new records out with that new partner for, say, a year or 18 months until they've maybe recovered that amount of money which was originally spent on them. So I think that's something, that's, that's something that we really want to push. I think another thing to look out for whenever signing thing is what I'd call a hidden distribution fee. So smaller independent labels, for example, they won't be able to distribute directly into the DSP, so Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer. There will be a middleman in between, which is we'd call generally an aggregator, and there will be a percentage that's taken, and that can vary. That can be anywhere from, I'd say, about 5% or 7%, all the way up to 25%, depending on what external services that particular independent label is using with that aggregator. So what I'd always do is ask, what is that distribution fee? Because it could be that if it is a 25% fee and you're getting 50% with the label, then actually you're only getting 50% of 75%. So I think that's just something to be aware of as well. The, the other end of the spectrum is like a CD Baby model. Some of you may be using people like, or organizations like CD Baby, where literally you just pay a fee to upload. I've never, I've never worked for a distributor. I don't understand how it works. But I've never understood why, it, why it's right to give away a percentage for uploading something. And that's a very controversial view, and I'm sure I'll be um, beaten up by a distributor in, uh, in short order. But if you are in a position where you're funding something yourself, always consider doing one of the kind of pay-to-play uh, aggregators rather than a distributor who would take a percentage. It'll end up much cheaper for you in, in the long run. Yeah. I think something else to flag as well is anything is record deals or recording situations which include what are called your publishing rights. So obviously there are two key copyrights which the industry is propped up by. One is publishing or the rights in your composition, so the rights in your songwriting. So when you, when you sit and you, and you write some lyrics, you write some chords, there is copyright in that, and that is, that's music publishing. The other key copyright is master copyright or records, and that's the recording of that song. Ideally, what we want in the industry is for those two different copyrights to be 
administered separately and kept totally separately, kept totally separate from the same company. So usually you have music publishers and record labels. What you don't want is to be doing a record deal which incorporates your music publishing as well because it will stop you doing a deal elsewhere. At a Unless there's a good financial reason to do so. Sometimes that, there is, yeah. Someone's giving you a bucket of cash, you might consider it. <laughs> I think um, that's actually on, on my list. They're the key. The key they're, there are key things to flag, I think, at an early stage. Do you have anything to... I'm not sure. I, I think you've pretty much covered it. Okay, good. Um, yeah. I think one of, the, one of the key things to say is if you have the opportunity to take advice from a lawyer when you're being shown any sort of deal that has a long-term impact on you, be it taking rights away from you or particularly tying you exclusively as an artist to an organisation, be it a private practice lawyer or the musicians' union lawyers, um, having a conversation with someone to query, because what I thought, I worked in management before I became a lawyer, I thought like 90% of what you were sent as a document basically couldn't change and you could tweak a few things. Everything is up for discussion. Um, and don't be scared to ask somebody to change something in an agreement. Um, and if you can get someone to advise you what needs to be changed, so much the better. So I think that's pretty much it in terms of a, a quick gallop through uh, what's changed in, in the recorded music side of the industry over the last 15 years. Um, can't really see any of you, but do any of you have any questions? Yeah. Right. How are we going to do this? So the question was, are we seeing many people come in about Web3 opportunities? And yes, we're doing, there was a kind of flurry of an enormous amount of NFT activity. Uh, what was it, about September last year? That's when it really, really kicked off. Um, and there was a kind of bump for about two months where everyone was trying to tokenize artwork, they were trying to tokenize um, music rights. Uh, and quite a lot of people tried to have a go at tokenizing royalty streams as well. Um, tokenizing of artwork is one thing. It's a fairly simple right. Uh, you can grant relatively controlled and simple rights in that. Tokenizing music is much more complicated because generally an artist has given away the master rights to a record company, publishing rights to a publishing company, and the record companies and the publishing companies had not worked out what on earth this was. So the way that people generally approached it around that time was, Let's tokenize it, let's do a drop, um, and then let's mop up the mess afterwards. And that's generally how people, people did it. I'm not entirely sure that the publishers and the record companies have really got an idea of how to deal with it still, um, because it can be so many different things. You think of what, uh, um, what an offering could be. It could be a ticket with an exclusive piece of artwork and then some music in there as well. How do you attribute the value between those things in, in a drop? Um, so it's, a, it's an in, enormously complicated thing. I think also the kind of trying to tokenize royalty flows came up against securities and exchange and financial conduct issues. Um, and so that a lot of them were just kind of cut off at the knees pretty quickly. Um, I think the Web 3.0 is going to be super, super exciting for the music industry, probably as much as any industry. But I don't think our feeling is necessarily that we've hit on the on the application, which is, is actually going to move things forward quite yet. It feels a bit, or it has felt a bit bubbly. What do you reckon, Ben? I think so. I've seen, I'd agree, I think there was a massive flurry last September, but I'd say it's accelerated again recently. I think it hit a massive peak, it came down a bit, and now it's, I think people are looking into it more and what it, what it actually means. But I think what, what I would say as well, we went through a period with, with artists, of artists wanted to, wanting to do it, and were they in breach of their record deal or not. So I've now started to, I get a lot of questions from artists saying, okay, can I exclude Web3 opportunities from my record deal? And the answer is, as soon as you ask the question, um, the record companies are not, are not having it yet, but we are continuing to do our best on that. They, they don't know what yeah. Web3 Web is, um, and they don't know what it will become. So the idea of excluding it from their exclusive rights when it might be like excluding digital distribution 20 years ago, they, they don't want to be caught out. So yeah, it's just still generally cool. I think that's my my comment. Has any, any anyone yeah. else burning questions? Um, what about from an artist management sort of standpoint with a lawyer? Like, how would that work? Sorry, Rather than the artist, and what about from like an artist management point of view? Um, 
seeking out a lawyer? Like, what kind of things? So seeking they out need? a lawyer? Yeah. yeah. Well, obviously, would they need a lawyer to, like, do a management deal with their artist and yeah. what kind of things would, like, they need to know? Yeah, so... The, the, the management, so the question was, just in case anyone didn't hear, do, do managers need lawyers as well? Um, yeah. And yes, they do. Um, it's a much less involved relationship between a, uh, a manager and a lawyer than it is between an artist and a lawyer. Generally, a manager would have a lawyer to help them draft an agreement, which they would then roll out across however many artists they've got. There's then an individual negotiation on an artist-by-artist artist basis, but generally there's a single document that a manager needs. Um, so as a manager is setting up a management company, if they want to have a management agreement in place, then that's when they would get a lawyer. It should be noted, a lot of managers don't have management agreements in place. Like I know this isn't a, um, a discussion of uh, management agreements, but just to touch on it very briefly, um, the, a management agreement basically protects a manager in terms of saying, you are tied to me Exclude you, the artist, are tied to me, the manager, exclusively for a period of time. And the artist lawyers use the management agreement as an opportunity to say, OK, fine, we'll do that. But if this goes wrong, we can get out. And this is what you're allowed to commission on. This is what you're not allowed to commission on. This is how expenses are covered. So the artist uses the opportunity to really nail down a lot of the detail of the relationship. Um, and the other principal thing that a management agreement does for a manager is it covers off post-term commission. And to what extent does that apply if you don't have a management agreement in place? It's an argument. If you break up with, a man with an artist, if a manager breaks up with an artist without a management agreement in place and with no discussion about post-term commission, there's always an almighty fight. So uh, probably, if you are a manager, quite a good idea to get, to get something in place. Hello. Have you got any advice for someone starting their own record label? Just a small one. That, that's a big one. Go on, Ben. Um, hopefully there are some, some great artists that you want to sign. I think that's probably the, the, the key one. But I think, I think going back to, I mentioned distribution fees earlier. I think if you are starting an independent label, it's about find, in turn finding your partner who is going to distribute you. So in the same way as some of the distributors might do direct artist deals like ADA, Believe and The Orchard, they also do label deals. And I think you have to look around all of those, and they're not it's, it's a difficult thing because you can't just approach them and say, "Okay, please could you please could you distribute my label?" For example, it, there is a I say there is some there's a barrier to entry with it, but I think once you're on the other side of that, you can then look at who offers the best service and who who will do the most for you in terms of, for example, an example would be pitching to editorial at Spotify. That is a service that some of those distributors would offer, um, and some might not. Some might just be a basic, we mentioned aggregators, just getting the music up there and getting it from A to B. There are, I think one distributor we didn't mention actually, just coming into my head, is Republic of Music, and I think they are a little bit freer in terms of the labels who they will do a deal with, and I think I've seen them be very effective with their editorial pitching as well. So there are definitely people out there who can, who can help you yeah, get the records from A to B, but I think that's I think logistically, that's probably the first point. I think there's another point which touches on what Ben said about finding the amazing artist to sign. Having a culture around an indie label is really important. And if you look at the labels who've been successful, be it Hospital Records, be it Warp, Ninja, Communion, um, or the kind of more modern ones who've only recently been started, like Dirty Hit, um, they've all got a kind of a, a creative line that you can thread between what they, uh, through what they do. Um, the more scattergun you are creatively in terms of what your output is as a record label, the more difficult it is for people to kind of um, gravitate towards you. If you become a bit of a cultural voice in a scene, it's much more effective in terms of attracting more artists in that sort of, sort of world. I think uh, another big point is to do... Obviously, everybody is here to make a living and make some money, but I think do friendly deals. It's, um, I know as artist lawyers, when, when we get a deal that comes across our desk which is just too hardcore, it often it results in a difficult conversation somewhere. So I'd say if you're putting out record deals or trying to sign artists, it should be in a way 
which benefits everyone and where the artist, I think, can see the other side of the deal, I think is probably the best, or not the light at the end of the tunnel because there are some positives along the way, but maybe that's um, the most useful metaphor at the moment. But I think, what would you, in terms of a fair deal from an independent label, I know there are very broad parameters, but things in, that we would be looking for. I think profit splits are good um, because... I think you can explain that over a drink with an artist. You can justify, we're putting a load of money and effort in, you're putting your creative in. It's a, it's a partnership. I think it's a lot easier to stand alongside that than a lot of the other structures of record, record deals. Um, and I agree with you. I think presenting something that's fair, that you actually stand by, is, is a really important thing for starting relationships with artists. Nowadays, algorithms get really important and uh, record labels usually have contacts with big platforms like Spotify or Instagram and know about what is pop and what gets featured and how do you master those algorithms and maybe how do you get to know about these algorithms as maybe not a record label? I think it's one of the great dark arts of the modern music industry. It's so difficult for anybody outside that system to know how to, how to game it. Um, I think the major labels have, they've got various kind of in-house playlists on the DSPs so they can pitch stuff. I think people are tweaking music so that it is algorithmically favorable, so putting choruses first. Um, it's very interesting actually to see the shift in culture that different formats suddenly created. I, I was talking about this earlier, that the album didn't exist properly until somebody created a piece of vinyl that was big enough to hold an album then uh, jump forward however long um, and on streaming people are terrified of people skipping on from your track so they're moving the choruses earlier in the song so people, people's attention is held on to and then move forward to now where people are really creating content for TikTok super super short form content um, I think culture will always shift to format at the moment I don't have any visibility on how algorithms within the DSPs work. I think algorithm, I think it's become synonymous with interaction. So I think the way, the way these things work, and there are, some, there are some mythical beings out there who do sit and do this with Spotify, and a lot of what it focuses around are what's called third-party playlists. So not, not the editorial playlist which Spotify curates internally and which people pitch to. So, for example, I know... It, cracking the algorithm, so to speak, I think some people have claimed to do it based on a very manual process of actually looking, okay, where are my listeners, for example, say, okay, your listeners are in Oslo. And at that point, you then start writing to third-party playlists, playlists in Oslo, even if that... But a third-party playlist could be anybody in the room. I'm sure you've all got a playlist on Spotify which you've created that says something like Sunday Chilled Playlist. So it would be about if your music is a chilled out song that you'd listen to on a Sunday and it's getting listened to in Norway, what some people now specialize in doing is writing to third party playlisters in Norway and seeing how it interacts. And then, I don't know, it might expand out to Bergen, one of the other cities in Oslo. It might expand around the rest of Scandinavia and people are generally, genuinely sitting doing that. I'm and exhausting. That, that, that is a service that people offer now. <laughs> so I think, yeah, and I think on on TikTok as well, that's what making the algorithm go is people, is people interacting with a piece of content. I also think there's an enormous amount of luck involved, whatever anybody is saying. I think success in the music industry, you can have the perfect song with the perfect artist at not the perfect time. You can have the perfect time with an imperfect artist with a reasonable song, and it works. It's, there, there are so many different factors. It used to be a question of... Uh, Actually, this, this opens up a whole different conversation. It used to be a question of get radio going, uh, then you're grabbing people's attention, and then you move to a bit of TV, and then suddenly you're, you're a household name. Now you have to have so many different plates spinning as an artist in order to gain proper traction. You can have a TikTok moment, but if it's not connecting elsewhere, it's very challenging. So while we've kind of laid out a beautiful modern view of how the music industry gives you an enormous amount of choice, Unfortunately, with that comes an enormous amount of complexity in terms of grabbing people's attention. Um, you mentioned earlier that you worked with an artist um, quite early on. Um, how would you 
um, go about like finding a manager or a lawyer like early on and like would they be responsible for finding a record deal for the artist sorry how do we go about finding managers and record deals like or, as an as a musician how as, a, would, as a musician how would I like how, how would I go about going like finding a manager or a lawyer so there are very few companies who do what we do actually I think they're like what five or six six or seven in the UK probably a, a few more but eight or ten yeah, yeah, eight, eight or ten in the UK yeah. not not that many um, and they can be found kind of in any of the kind of music directories that you look in. Um, I think at an early stage, if it's just cold calling, that is just literally cold calling, sending, sending a SoundCloud link to a bunch of lawyers. Um, if you have a way of uh, self-releasing, getting your music out and starting to get some traction in terms of movement on DSPs um, with your music and people come to you, so much the better. Um, we are actually approached less than we approach people, probably is fair to say, in terms of the people that we take on. We tend to, we get approached a reasonable amount, but we find out about artists, like with Lewis, we got a call from a promoter saying, there's this amazing guy with a voice in, in Glasgow. And we went, went to go and track him down. Um, right, so a lot of it is us going out rather than people coming in, in terms of management, I think it's a similar sort of thing. Some of those relationships start with literally an email. Um, a lot of them start with an open mic night or uh, appearing on a playlist or uh, a manager, famously Lewis's manager, found him by trawling through SoundCloud late at night. At 4 a.m. he found, found Lewis on a kind of SoundCloud deep dive. So existing basically online and doing everything you can to make yourself more noticeable is the best, the best thing that you can do. Is that it? Right, we're done. Thank you very much for all coming. Cheers, guys.